We always are in fear that at some point, some internet company's not going to like what we're saying, like Google, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, who knows, maybe even Sermon Audio may not like us one of these days and they'll take us off. We'll have to find a different way of getting the word out. But for now, we're going to do it while we have it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It's where we want to go. I've got something neat in case you haven't. If you've never seen this, I'm going to show you something brand new this morning. And um, it's not new to me. It's not new to a lot of you. But it's one of those things. It just makes the Bible, to me, it makes it make sense. What we know today in our world, no, people didn't know it. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, people just didn't know these things. And I'm talking about things related to the human body, things related to the universe, how big space is, how far it is to the edge of the universe. We don't even know that. We can't even see it. But we know that it's as far as God says it was, as high above the earth. So that's how far God's thoughts are, of, are above our thoughts and so on. So anyway, I like to uh, include things like this when, when I run across them in the scriptures. We started on this last Sunday morning, Galatians chapter 2. Um, Galatians chapter 3, I asked the question a couple weeks ago about who hath bewitched you. And we talked a little bit. I told you I was going to bring up the issue of witchcraft. And I've got some things to share with you uh, once we get to that point. But Galatians chapter 2 Verse 16, the Bible says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And where did that faith come from? It came from Jesus Christ to us by way of the Holy Spirit, by way of the word of God. That's how we, that's how we got that faith. Christ originated it. He brought, brought it down to earth. The Holy Spirit brought it to us. We believed it. We still believe it. We give the praise to God. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Nobody in the Old Testament was ever saved by keeping the law because no, you have to keep the law perfectly. You have to obey Ten Commandments. You have to not fail them ever in life. And if you do, it's an offense. Just like if you were caught speeding or you were caught stealing or you were caught cheating on taxes or you were caught with something else. It's an offense and those don't go away. I was watching uh, Live PD last night. They pulled a guy over and the cop was laughing at the guy and he said, I pulled your name up. You've got an arrest warrant from 15 years ago. It was 15, <laughs> it's 15 years since he's ever been pulled over. Yeah, my luck, I'd get an arrest warrant for something to be caught that day. But anyway, that, those things just don't go away when you have an offense recorded in heaven. It's waiting for you there when you show up. No statute of limitations on it. Yeah, it's going to have to be dealt with. So no one in the Old Testament was ever justified by the works of law. They were justified by faith. They believed what God said. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For though, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Uh, while I'm thinking about this, turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Because Romans 7, in Galatians 2, what he just said here, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Romans chapter 7 is a perfect way of illustrating this. I want you to look at... Verse 7 of Romans 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. That's the purpose of the law. 
purpose of speed limit signs is not so that no one speeds. Because it doesn't work. It's to tell you what the law is and what the limit is. And if you, it notifies you that if you go over that and exceed that and are caught, you have offended the law and there must be a penalty imposed upon that. But speed limit signs only work for those who keep the law. They only work for people who say, okay, speed limit 35, I better do about 34. People who have no intention on keeping the law, they see that sign. It obviously doesn't do them any good. They're going 50, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. I got caught doing, what was it? 65 and a 35 in Hillsboro years ago. I, I honestly thought, the speed limit was 55. Honestly did. So I did 65. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying I was not guilty. But I didn't think I was that guilty. And the cop said, no, it's 35 until you get down there. And I went, oh. So anyway. But that's the purpose of the, that's what he said. The law is there to tell you what sin is. What you can and cannot do. But it doesn't keep us from doing it. It doesn't stop us. So uh, he said, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin. And obviously, Paul then, in verse 7, to me, he's admitting that he is coveted. He's admitting that he's lusted. After something, we know Paul didn't really have a desire for women. So it probably wasn't a woman he lusted after, but it may have been something else. This flesh covets things. Our eyes see things, whether it's another woman, another man, or a house, or a car, or somebody's whatever. We look upon that and say, I want that. That's lust. That's covetousness. We wouldn't know that that was a sin, except God said, thou shall not covet. So, and I think Paul's admitting that. So verse 8, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, that's his thoughts and, and the things that go through his mind, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, I'm not exactly sure what Paul means by that, but I'll give you my little spin on it. When I was one and a half, two years old, I didn't know what sin was. I was alive, but I didn't know what sin was. I didn't know what was right. I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know I was guilty of things. I grew to an age where I realized things were wrong. Things that I did were wrong. Sin revived, and at that point, I'm dead. And my body, my flesh, is going to be held accountable for the things I've done even as a child. Which is why when I was nine, I asked my mom, Mom, can I get saved? I don't want to go to hell. So sin revived, I died. Verse 10, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Paul used to think he was really in the law. But when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, he realized he was breaking the very law that he was zealous for. For sin taking occasion, verse 11, by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. God it's like God gives one commandment in Genesis to Adam, don't do this one thing. And then by the time the Israelites get to Mount Sinai, God's sending them 10 things that they can't do. And God just made sin exceeding sinful. How do you, how do you not break one of those? How do you spend a life not breaking 10 commandments? I haven't, I haven't figured, I've never done that. The only one that's done that, that's Christ. So, 
verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do allow, for that which I do, I allow not. Paul, now Paul is talking about his two eyes. The eye of this flesh and the eye of the soul in us and the new man. For that which I do, my flesh, I, my soul, my spirit, the inner man, allow not. I know it's wrong. For what I would, which is related to your will. Okay? For what I would, what my inner man wills to do, that do I not. My outer man. But what I hate, the inner man that do I, the outer man. And therein lies the two natures of man. The corrupt flesh, sinful nature that we have. And the new nature given to us by God and his spirit and his son living in us. That inner man, according to John, never sins. Because it was born of God, born again. The outer man, there's no hope for it. No hope, which is why we're growing older and our bodies are getting weaker and we're appointed unto death. So verse 16, if then I do, I do that which I would not, the I do is the flesh, the I would not is the spirit, his inner man. I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I, the inner man, that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, now he's, he's showing you the distinction, dwelleth no good thing. For to will, our inner man is present with me. I never want to sin again. Never. That's present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. And here we are. This is the best Christian ever in the world. Admitting that he himself needed a savior he had to have one so verse 19 for the good that i would i do not but the evil which i would not that i do now if i do that what i would not it is no more i that do it but sin that dwelleth in me and then he says and this is the connection here with galatians 2 where paul said for i through the law am dead to the law that i might live unto god Verse 21, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the part that wants always to do right. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. This is what Jesus was referring to when he says, the spirit indeed truly is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I says, for I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. It's in my fingers, my legs, it's in my belly, it's in my eyes, my ears. It's, it's in, dwells in my flesh and it's wicked, it's corrupt and we're producing corruption. Oh, wretched man that I am. Present tense. And I had a lady chew me out because I said something on a radio show years ago that we're Christians, but we still sin. And she called me to chew me out. She said, you don't, you don't sin after you're saved. You don't do it. And I quoted this. I said, Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, not that I used to be. I said, oh, and that was the apostle Paul. Do you think you're better than the apostle Paul? She didn't like that. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So, back to Galatians 2. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, 
in my flesh that I might live unto God, the inner man, which is renewed every day. The inner man doesn't sin, it's renewed, it's renewed in knowledge, it's renewed, the inner man's new every day, the inner man cannot sin because it is born from God, the outer man was conceived by my earthly mother and father. They were sinners, their parents were sinners, their parents were sinners, it goes all the way back to Noah, it goes all the way back to Adam through Seth. So, uh, let's see here, turn to Romans Turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's see what I got. Come, yeah, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of of Christ so we could not approach God but now because of the blood and its eternal blood and it's on God's throne the ark of his new covenant which John saw in heaven in the book of Revelation there is blood sprinkled on that altar and it's the blood of Jesus Christ who was the lamb but he was also the high priest it was his blood, but he also offered that blood and shed that blood. So now that we can be nigh to God, we can pray to God, we can call to God, we can ask God for help, we can ask God for forgiveness, we can ask God for mercy, we can ask God to stop beating us with the rod. We can ask God all of these wonderful things now because of the blood of Christ. And it's not works that makes you nigh to God. It's not the fact that you didn't, that you didn't cuss all week long. It's not the fact that, uh, you didn't look at another woman all week long. It's not that you didn't lie all week long. It's not that you didn't steal all week long. That does not make you nigh unto God. It is the blood of Christ that makes you nigh unto God. For He is our peace. He is the one that has broken the enmity between us and God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Christ is the ultimate peacemaker. Because he satisfies the just demands of God so that we can be at peace with God. And God is not now going to cast us into the lake of fire and say, Depart from me, for I never knew you. He says to those of us, who are saved and by faith, he says to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful. You were full of faith. You believed what I said. So fever, he is our peace who hath made one, who hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. When Christ died on the cross, the veil rent in the temple. And for the first time, they're able to see into the most holy place. And what do they see? Cobwebs. No Ark of the Covenant. God made sure that that earthly Ark of the Covenant disappeared. We don't know where it is to this day. We don't know where it is. It's not at Area 51. It's not in a warehouse from the government. It's not. There's a church in Ethiopia that claims that they have the Ark of the Covenant inside that church and they don't let anybody in to go see it. Isn't that interesting? Now, I don't know if they have it or not. I, I used to care. I used to go, boy, I want to know where that is. I don't care anymore because that Ark is not where my salvation is. My salvation is on the Ark in heaven. So they look, the veil's torn. They look, there's no Ark there. It's not, and they hadn't, the Jews had not sacrificed a sacrifice in the temple since they came back from Babylonian captivity because there was no ark to sprinkle the blood on of atonement on the day of atonement every year. Back in when Moses day, they sprinkled the blood once a year on the day of atonement. The high priest goes in, sprinkles the blood, comes out. 
That happened every year. But since they came back from Babylonian captivity, there was no ark ever put into that second temple. It was gone. Disappeared. The ark, the table, of, they made a list in Jeremiah of every piece of furniture that they stole out of the temple and took to Babylon, including all the way down to the spoons and the candle snuffers. And what's missing from the list is the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and the candlestick. They're gone. Nobody knows what happened to them. Nobody knows where they went. Disappeared. God did that on purpose. He signified already that I'm done killing animals because that does not satisfy the demands of the law. I'm going to send my son as the lamb to die. And that's what he did. So verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, every single one of them, for to make in himself of twain us and Christ one new man. So making peace. God is not mad at his son Jesus because his son Jesus was obedient. So if we are in Christ, God is not mad at us. He's not at enmity between, with us. We are in Christ for to make himself one of twain, one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Notice that he said in one body by the cross. Now, back in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. There's a lot of different applications for this, a lot of different meanings, a lot of different understandings. Um, as it is appointed unto man once to die and after this judgment, so you and I, and I preached this last Sunday morning, as, as bad as we hate death, it is the way that we get to heaven. As bad as we fear death, either our own or someone else's. We're afraid. Gary went up last week hearing that his mother's only got 24 hours or less to live. His hope was to get up there before he died, before she died. And I'm preaching on death last Sunday. Gary's sitting over there bawling his eyes out. And I said, I hope no one dies this week because then I don't want you to think I preached it because somebody was going to die. But God took his mom home. That's what death is. So in that sense, we are crucified with Christ. This body of sin has to die before we can be free. It also means that Jesus said, except ye take up your cross Daily. Daily. And follow me. You're not worthy to be my disciples. The cross is where our sins are nailed to. To get rid of them. Paul said, mortify therefore the members. The deeds of your body. Mortify them. Kill them. That means... Starve them out. Quit feeding them. Cut them off. Uh, I'm not going to give too many illustrations on that, but that's what that means. The deeds of your body and the members of your body, mortify them. Quit feeding them. He said, so I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look at this. This is your DNA. Psalm 139, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So the deeds, the, the members of your body are all written in a book, just like David said 3,000 years ago, called DNA. And to me, it's always interesting that when, those, when that DNA is packaged in every cell in your body, it's packaged in what they call chromosomes. They call them chromosomes because they, they added dye, different colors of dye to the cell, and the chromosomes 
lit up with those colors like the rainbow in Ezekiel 1 or Revelation chapter 4. So chromos means color. Your, chromo, your chromatic camera was a color camera. So the chromosomes where your DNA is rolled up like a scroll and every one of them are in the shape of a cross. You have, you have 46 of them in every cell in your body. And in that DNA is written your death sentence. Remember what I said last Sunday morning. We have a sentence of death on us. A sentence, meaning it's written out that we're going to die. That's written in your DNA. That you're going to die. It is appointed unto man once to die. That's the sentence in the Bible of death. And we have that written in our DNA. Our DNA, I talked about this last Sunday morning, programmed cell death. Every cell in your body is generated. It performs whatever function it's supposed to perform. And then it's programmed in there that at a certain point, it's died. It dies. It's killed. And it doesn't continue to live. And that's in every cell in your body. So think about it. how many cells are in the body. Trillions of them. That's how many crosses you have in you. You, have, you literally have Christ in you in the form of the book that God wrote in your cross chromosomes. Somebody say amen. I love this. That's what they all look like. It's what it is. We are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Because DNA, even though it's got a sentence of death in it, DNA is what gives us life. Your body is alive now because the DNA is still generating the cells and the proteins and the functions necessary to keep you alive. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I. But that, that is Christ living in me. <laughs> John 3, 14. As Moses lifted up the sea, it looks like Two snakes coiled up, doesn't it? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. 46 chromosomes, where all your DNA is. Now, let me run through the Bible very quickly. When Moses was instructed to build the tabernacle, God told him specifically, Put 20 boards along the north wall, 20 boards along the south wall, and six across the back. That's 46. And the book of the law was stored, George, inside those 46 boards that made the tabernacle. Moses didn't know that we had 46 chromosomes. But God showed him in heaven what the tabernacle was supposed to look like. And he said, build it exactly the way you see it. So that tabernacle was done away with because that even the body dies. So Solomon builds his temple and he puts two pillars in front of that temple. One's called Jachin and one's called Boaz. And they're 23 cubits tall, each one of them. It's 46. And inside there was the Ark of the Covenant with the book of the law in it. Just like in every cell in your body in 46 chromosomes. And then, that temple was destroyed. So they built another one. That's the one that Jesus went to and said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. And you know what they said? Forty and six years were we building this temple. Forty-six years. And you say you can build in three days. But they didn't know that he was talking about the temple of his, what? Body. You know what the 46th chapter of the New Testament is? Luke chapter 2. You know what's in Luke chapter 2? 
And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. 46th chapter of the New Testament is where Jesus is born. Jesus, who has the law written into his flesh so he can nail it, Brother George, to the cross. You know what the 46th book of the Bible is? 1 Corinthians. You know what it says in 1 Corinthians? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? This Bible's neat. See, we didn't know that. We didn't, nobody knew what book David would have been referring to in Psalm 139, 16 when he said, In thy book all my members were written. Until... Watson and Crick, two scientists back in the 50s, did the calculations and figured out that DNA was two phosphorus sugar ladder legs that was put together by four base pairs. And in those base pairs was the coating of life. And it was coiled up like a rolled up scroll. So then, in the late 90s and into 2000s, there was a race then called the Human Genome Project. Who was going to be the first scientist to figure out how to read the human DNA strand? And they figured it out. They figured out that you can read the human genome just like you can read your Bible. But then, once they figured out how to read it, they figured out a way to rewrite it that's where we're getting in trouble now because it's just like saying I don't like what's in my Bible so I'm going to rewrite it so some doctor looks at you or some insurance company looks at you and says we've done a DNA profile of you and we don't like what's written in your DNA and we're going to insist that you have this changed or we won't cover your your health we won't cover you anymore that's coming don't let them do it that book of your dna is just as sacred as this book that god has given you to read we don't change it we don't supposed to we don't have a license to and with it being as miraculous as that that's Christ living in me, in every cell of my body. Christ is in there in the form of the book that God wrote. And I, I love to teach on this stuff. Paul, 2 Corinthians 4.10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Look at that. Paul didn't even know what he was talking about. You are bearing about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus because it's like the serpent on the pole in the wilderness and that's Christ lifted up on the cross and that's every package of DNA in your body. You have bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Thank you. I was on a roll. All right, so next Sunday, we'll talk about witchcraft. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Somebody bewitched that church. Remember the show? Bewitched? Remember that? And she would cast spells. Things would happen. Okay? And I'm going to talk about that next. I'm going to talk about how witchcraft is in churches now. And it ain't right. But it's there. 